Based on the size of tonight's crowd, I don't think our speaker is going to need much of an introduction. In fact, he asked me not to give him too much of an introduction. Mark Perry is the executive director of Florida Oceanographic Society. He's also one of the most passionate and, and well-versed and educated and knowledgeable advocates for our environment that this area has ever seen, a role that he's been filling for more than four decades. Mark's powerful voice has helped to educate generations of Treasure Coast citizens about environmental issues that are so important to all of us. Tonight, Mark's going to be giving us an update on the health of our local estuaries following the summer of 2019, a summer that looked a whole lot better than our last few summers in terms of water quality. Mark will also get us up to speed on some of the uh, bigger projects that are aimed at fixing Florida's more pressing water issues. And with that, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce Mark Perry. Okay. Thank you. All right, I, I'm so glad to be here tonight. Thanks all for coming out tonight. And uh, we're going to talk about the waters in Florida, but particularly about uh, what it looked like here this past year and why it's uh, what I call a hope for healthier waters, because it's really uh, hopeful to our future. Um, many of us who've been around for a while have seen the waterways and we'll take a look at how they, they've been demised by a, a lot of things that and the pollution that has come into the system. But what I want to do tonight is kind of go through a briefing of what it was like last year and why I'm hopeful for this year in 2020 as well. So I want to start out pretty much by looking at the way it was in history. And prior to the 1900, it was basically, as you see there on the left, the upper chain of lakes near Orlando, south of Orlando, where that green starts up there, was the headwaters of the Everglades. And that's uh, small creeks that entered into about 11 small lakes up there. They all channelized down into the larger lake up there, Lake Kissimmee. And the Kissimmee River used to meander and back and forth in an oxbow fashion about 105 miles long before it reached the big lake in the middle, which is Lake Okeechobee, about 730 square mile lake. And then that river of grass used to overflow south of Lake Okeechobee as it had overflowed its bank to the south in a very shallow, wide, about 30, 40 mile wide, 100 mile long, shallow, about one foot to two foot deep river. And this was aptly described by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas back in 1947 when she wrote her book, The Everglades, River of Grass. And this slow moving, about one mile every four days, kept that slow flow of water from fresh water from Lake Okeechobee moving south through hydrating those river of grasses, vast sawgrass marshes, and then eventually into Florida Bay. Florida Bay, as you know, is in between the Keys and the tip of Florida, and is a saltwater environment, but it interacts with that freshwater coming in from the Everglades, and that creates what we call an estuarine environment, the mixture of freshwater and saltwater together, and forms one of the largest seagrass beds in the world, over 500,000 acres of seagrass between um, the Keys and the tip of Florida. Also, that Kissimmee River used to meander back and forth, and that watershed had a two-mile wide floodplain. So when it got real wet, it would get real wide, and then when it get narrow, it dry, it'd be very narrow. And that used to take about six or eight months for that water to meander down slowly. I'm going to come back to those time frames, but what happened now? Why is this current flow the way it is? What happened to bring all this water all of a sudden. Now only it takes two to three days because we channelized the Kissimmee River. We dug a channel right up the middle of the Oxbows and we dug ditches over to the east and the west to the St. Lucie on the east coast and the Caloosahatchee River on the west where the major amount of outflow goes and the other outflow goes south and to the east out to the Atlantic or Gulf of Mexico. And I put down at the bottom here how much water flows out to the Atlantic and Gulf, about 1.7 billion gallons a day. And to put that in perspective, all of us 8 million people who live in this South Florida area, we consume about 1.3 billion gallons a day. So we're actually putting to tide or to the Atlantic and Gulf more fresh water than we're actually consuming. And there's a cost involved with that. But what happened? How did that, that happen and get here? Well, two big things. We wanted to drain the swamp and we dammed the Lake Okeechobee. We drained the swamp because back in the 1900, up in that far left uh, side, is when we started digging ditches and draining the Everglades. 
The Florida legislature looked at it in 1900 and 1911 report, actually. They said that Everglades system is a valueless swamp full of alligators and mosquitoes, and nobody will come to Florida unless we drain it. So they paid people like Hamilton Diston from Pennsylvania and others to come down and dig ditches and dig channels through there, try to control the lake. And they did uh, somewhat of a good job in trying to drain the system, but not quite enough. And along in 1926 and 28 came two major hurricanes across the state uh, without warning and killing over 2,500 people lost their lives around the lake. So they authorized the Herbert Hoover Dyke during that Herbert Hoover administration, and it was completed in 1937. That dyke around most of the 143-mile perimeter of the lake dammed off or diked off that flow of water south from uh, Lake Okeechobee South. But in our minds, it was controlling that water. It was trying to control that flooding and never let that happen again. What happens now is that the Corps of Engineers, who was in that process at the time and were sub subpoenaed by the state to say, hey, we need you to come here and help uh, build that dike and build that system. They now regulate that level in Lake Okeechobee very carefully because they don't want that dike to breach or break. They don't want that to, uh, again, flood people around the lake. So they have it as a regulation schedule. It's part of a water control plan in the Central and South Florida Flood Control Project. And that uh, translates to a management ban in this calendar from January to December each year. They look at the lake level and they try to manage it within this ban to get it to the lowest point possible by June 1st. Now, why would that be? Well, in June 1st starts our hurricane season. And as you know, if you've been here, tropical storms and hurricanes bring a lot of rain and they can fill up the lake very quickly. So they would like to have that lake be at a lower level. So they have this operational band that's pretty flexible. Below that is a water shortage band. If the lake gets too low, there are people that depend on the lake for water supply, whether it's for irrigation or water. So these two charts at the bottom, they discharge, they make a decision. They say, well, if the lake's at this level, we go down the decision tree, and if it's the tributaries are, are wet, if the seasonal conditions are going to be wet, then we can discharge up to so much uh, cubic feet per second to the east and so much to the west. And these two discharge points are to what they call the tide or to estuaries, the Caloosahatchee on the west coast and the St. Lucie on the east coast. The other chart says we'll release water south to the water conservation areas, but only up to the maximum extent practicable. And a lot of times those water conservation areas are too full, and so they can't regulate. But last year we had almost an ideal perfect year. And that's why I wanted to show you this chart. Do you remember that band that I talked about and how that... Those dark lines want to get that operational band down to low point in June 1st and then let the lake come back up. Well, this is what happened last year. Back in the spring, back this time, February, March, they were releasing some water and having what they call operational flexibility. So they wanted to release a little bit. But we said, don't release any to the estuaries by spawning season, which starts in March and April, because that's when fish spawn and others, and they can't tolerate that freshwater condition. So they did, and they stopped those, and the lake kept moving down because we had a pretty dry, wet season. So by June 1st, we were just below 11 feet, about 10.79 feet, and that's elevation of the lake in NGVD. It's not the depth of the lake. So they got it down to 10.79 feet. They allowed it to go back up, and this, the grasses that you see on the far left and over here increased in the lake. Now, why is that? Well, when the lake got low, it got clear down to the bottom, and the emergent and submergent vegetation was able to grow quite well and they had no releases um, to, from the lake to these estuaries. So that was a pretty good year, and if you were around here, the water was very clear, and you could see bottom a lot of places in the river. Now our St. Lucie River is also a freshwater system north and south, and it can get a uh, color to it. The water has a color, a brown color. That's a tannic or tannins in the water from the root systems. And it gives a brown color, but it's clear. You can actually see to the bottom. So we, we know we have a brown river, but it's not uh, all stirred up with all the muck and mud. So this is what a chart looks like almost every day. The uh, Corps of Engineers and the South Florida Water Management District 
monitor and control uh, these structures about how much goes to the west, to the Clusatchee, or to the east, in the St. Lucie, and also down to the south in these areas here. And depending on water conservation areas, how full they are, the remnant Everglades, they may not have the capacity south of the lake to do that. So this is another, uh, this is back in 2018, and it's just a demonstration of how many billions of gallons came into the lake, about 529. 97 or 100 billion went to the east, about twice as much went to the west, and then only about 114 billion went from the lake to the Everglades. What did go south, though, was also the EA water supply, the Everglades Agricultural Area, about 700,000 acres of farmland south of the lake, which is primarily sugarcane, about 467,000 acres. And then another runoff went also south to 307 billion gallons. All of that water going south from that EAA created a high level condition in the uh, water conservation areas and there wasn't much capacity to take from the lake. Now remember back in that historical flow, 100% of all that lake water went south. None of it went east or west. The St. Lucie estuary to the east was never connected to the lake and also to the west. Right behind the, the 233 billion gallon sign was the headwater of the Caloosahatchee River, Lake Hiccupichee, which is a small lake up in that area. But look how much phosphorus, nitrogen, and total suspended solids, millions of pounds of those nutrients, which are good for every life, but if you get too much, is not good. And it's a pollution to our waters. If you have too much phosphorus in fresh water, too much nitrogen in estuaries, and the total suspended solids are all that stirred up turbidity that you see big plumes of that go out over our near shore reefs and our systems. So when this canal was built, this is the St. Lucie Canal. You see Lake Okeechobee over there to the left. You see the red arrows to the right. It enters into the South Fork of the St. Lucie River. You see the North Fork, north of Stewart. That meanders all the way up almost to White City and Fort Pierce, about 23 miles north of Stewart. And it meanders down and joins to the South Fork here right at Stewart and heads east around the wide part of the estuary and connects to the ocean at the St. Lucie Inlet. But when we dug this canal back in 1916 to 1928, and then it was actually expanded after the dike was built. It was mainly built to have that capacity for discharge. They thought at first it'd be a nice cross Florida canal and they expected all this commercial traffic to use it. Well, it ends up that only about 5% of the traffic through that Okeechobee waterway is actually commercial. Most of it is recreational. So we also have other canals which were built in the 40s and 50s, those black lines up there called C23, Canal 23 or Canal 24. They're not connected to Lake Okeechobee, but they were built primarily to drain that area for citrus farming. Citrus needs very dry feet, and those days we wanted to build these canals to drain those areas. And of course the most closest place was the North Fork of the St. Lucie River, so we just dumped it right in there had no idea of how much that was going to be damaging to our estuary. So we get a lot of systems, and a lot of you have been around for years past. In 2013 and 2016 and 18, there were times that when the turbidity gets so bad in, in the outer estuary, it covers over seagrass beds and oyster reefs, and even our near shore reefs, uh, right offshore of the St. Lucie Inlet. We have some of the the about 12 species of hard and soft corals you find the keys in the Bahamas. So we really have a, a valuable reef system right offshore, coral reef. And of course the human health impacts, as you heard about the blue-green algae that starts in the lake as a freshwater algae has come with those discharges and filled up the St. Lucie and made it where you can't go into the into that waterway or you have a risk of run a risk of health hazard and of course the economic impacts you can imagine businesses that drop 20 30 40 percent in home sales or waterfront property or boating fishing all the activities that go around our waterways our economy tanks basically when we get these major uh, impacts just as an example this is a salinity at the uh, roosevelt bridge right in the middle of Stewart, right in the middle of the estuary. And remember, it's in the middle of the estuary, so it's a mixture of the salt water in the ocean and fresh water up in the upstream. 
that the salt water in the ocean is a constant salinity at about 35 parts per thousand. And that 35 parts per thousand is everywhere in the ocean. And fresh water, though, if you go way upstream, is zero parts per thousand. So that's the scale, zero to 35. At the Roosevelt Bridge, it's usually up there about 25 parts per thousand, right, on the left-hand side. Well, what happened in May and June of this year, we started those big discharges, and you can see how that salinity dropped well below 10 parts per thousand, and it causes stress, harm, and death to our oyster reefs. Oysters are estuarine shellfish that have to open and close, and they siphon water, they filter water, and create beautiful reefs for about 300 different species of shrimp and crabs. But after 14 to 28 days, the oysters can't tolerate total fresh water. They have to open up, and if they do, then the osmotic pressures in their tissues causes them to die. So if we know if we have too long a duration of fresh water over oyster beds, they will expire, they'll die. And that's what happened in these cases uh, when these were long devastating. The other critical habitat to this estuary is in the outer estuary around the inlet. And these are called seagrasses. Think of seagrass underwater, it flowers and seeds underwater. And, and it's a meadow of grass that's a beautiful habitat. If you were a juvenile fish trying to find shelter and food, you'd be in this seagrass. So if you're a juvenile snook or tarpon or grouper or lobster, you'll be in those seagrass beds. Well, we had about four or 500 acres right inside, but as you can see in the salinity graphs, when that the salinities drop down to zero, it really hurts that seagrass. And particularly, one called Johnson seagrass is, a, is on the threatened and endangered species list. So we have some really critical habitat that gets affected. And this just shows you very graphically and, and visually, the one on the left is 2010, when we had a, all those dark shadow areas right inside the St. Lucie Inlet and Sailfish Point there. Uh, you can see are pretty void. There's sandbars over here on the right-hand side. So in 2017, all of those dark shaded, shaded areas where seagrass are now sandbar, and we've lost several hundred uh, acres of seagrass in that, in that particular area. Um, we also have heard about the blue-green algae, and the blue-green algae, there are a lot of different algaes in our state and in the water. You may see them, they may be blooming and you'll see visible signs, or they may just be there and not quantity enough to be visible. But the algae that we're very concerned about is a cyanobacteria called microcystis. And it bloomed in that red area in the middle in July of 2018, 92% of Lake Okeechobee was covered in this cyanobacteria. It literally looked like a green, uh, golf course, if you will, over there. And, and when they discharged the water, obviously during that year, along comes that algae. And it came and turned our whole estuary green and it was devastating uh, to a point because that, as it dies off and meets the salt water, it gives off its toxins. And the toxins can cause a hepatoxin, which is affecting our livers. But if a dog drinks it or even gets near it, it may cause that. And there's also aerosolization or mixing in the air of these uh, cyanobacteria that can cause our problems with our health. So it's a big health issue. And it's not just here at Lake Okeechobee. It's around the country now, in, in the Great Lakes, up in other lakes around our country. So we're real concerned. What causes those algae blooms? What is causing a bloom of something to grow so fast that it uh, you know, becomes very visible and very toxic? Well, it's, it's nutrients. It's the, what we particularly call phosphorus. And what we have here is the Water Management District telling us in these nine sub-watersheds that are north of the lake and around the lake, about 3.4 million acres of watershed to the lake, we know each watershed and we know exactly how much loading in metric tons of phosphorus is coming off and we know what the concentration of that phosphorus is coming off. And none of that total phosphorus loading or concentration is below the limits that we really want to set. So we are monitoring, we know where this is coming into the watershed and eventually into Lake Okeechobee, and this is where we got to go to try to stop it. Um, on the left-hand side, you see kind of the 
the Florida Department of Environmental Protection watershed assessment map, uh, realizing that most of that up there, the sources of total phosphorus is 78% agriculture. A lot of natural lands are 14% uh, probably, and urban runoff is about 7%. Everybody thinks all the runoff comes from Orlando and pollutes our waters, but we have a lot of other parts of that watershed. On the right-hand side, um, Dr. Gary Goforth and Todd Thurlow put together this map, and the red parts are well above that total maximum daily load of phosphorus that's allowed in the Lake Okeechobee. And even the yellow are almost, almost two or three times the amount of phosphorus coming in. So all of these nine subbasins and 32 subbasins need to be monitored and detected. There is a project that's trying to, a part of our Everglades restoration projects uh, that's called the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project. But it doesn't account for too much of building a reservoir or stormwater treatment areas for that water, polluted water, it's only accounting for about 900,000 acres where there's about two and a half million north of the lake. So it's, it's not a big enough project, enough, and doesn't have enough to it to really give it a thing. The other thing the Corps of Engineers is doing right now, and they started this last year, again, what gives me hope, is redoing that schedule, that Lake Okeechobee schedule, in order to reevaluate how much should they dump to the um, St. Lucie or Caloosahatchee during these times. And they're reopening up that uh, schedule. And it's going to take a while, probably until October 22, before that actually uh, they come up with the right schedule and the alternative. But they've opened it up to all the stakeholders around the lake and we're encouraged by what we call the new Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual. So they have various meetings. Now I expect you all to read all the detail in this, uh, this chart. Uh, this is what's updated periodically. It's called, don't get all upset, it's the Integrated Delivery Schedule. The Corps of Engineers is an engineering firm. They've got to have a schedule. Uh, they've got to build projects and engineer projects. So those timelines are from 2018 to 2030. Um, and those timelines have to be dependent on when you start a project and when it can get different phases of that project and when it gets completed over here to the right. Well, they want to move everything you know, to the left if they can and get it done ahead of time, but it counts on those two white lines up at the very top, which are the budget. So it depends on how much money you plug into the system. And the way we set up restoring the Everglades back in year 2000, we all signed this uh, comprehensive Everglades restoration plan, 68 different projects. How do we do that? How do we put them into place? It's going to cost $7.4 billion. And who, it's got to be a 50-50 cost share, 50% for the state, 50% for the federal level. Well, the state started trekking out and doing some of these projects, and the Corps had some foundation projects. One of those up in the top was to actually reconnect those oxbows. They filled in the C-38 canal in the Kissimmee, in the lower Kissimmee, and they actually reconnected the oxbows. And I've been up there, and the floodplain works, and everything is really healthy right now in that section where they restored the Kissimmee. So that's one of those foundation projects. But each year, those different colors represent what we call a Water Resource Development Act, a Water Act that has passed a, literally an act of Congress. Okay, this is literally an act of Congress that has to make this happen. And as you know, Congress is somewhat deadlocked sometimes. They can't get something done. There are other priorities. But this year, they were able to fund the $200 million uh, that the federal government needs, and it's matched by the $200 million the state puts up, and that's what's going to get us going on this line. So that's another real good reason why I'm very hopeful that because the funding is now moving forward to move these projects quicker and quicker uh, as we go along. One of those projects is south of Lake Okeechobee and you remember me talking about south of that lake this big orange area is known as the Everglades Agricultural Area. So imagine when they blocked off the flow to the lake that rich peat soil all south of the lake became very very valuable and in 1930 the U.S. Sugar Corporation was formed. They began farming about 200,000 acres. And later on in the 1950s, the Fonuel family from Cuba moved up, and they have Florida crystals for another 200 or so thousand acres. And then there's a cooperative of smaller sugar farmers. 
But most of that was pretty much laser leveled and, and really corded off. However, over on the left, those blue areas are where we actually bought some land to build either reservoirs or stormwater treatment areas to treat that runoff before it goes to the Everglades. Because the runoff from the EAA was up to three to 400 parts per billion and the Everglades was only 10 parts per billion in phosphorus. So it was polluting the Everglades. They had to do something with the runoff. And they put in all these uh, control structures. But I mentioned there are 289 permitted structures called works of the district. And why that's important is because this past year, 2019, the Water Management District started working on this rule. And this rule is Chapter 40E61 of Florida Administrative Code. And um, both on one side, the works of the district for Lake Okeechobee control about 755 permits. And over the works of the district for the Everglades Agricultural Area control about 20, 289 permits. Why is that important? This is the, the, the actual regulation to where they could regulate the amount of polluted pollution that comes off of this land into works of the district, meaning those canals, those ditches, whatever enters into the watershed. So this rule is now being revised this year. And the South Florida Water Management District will actually be meeting up here on January 31st in Port St. Lucie. But they have monthly governing board meetings uh, down in West Palm, which we attend. We try to get them to move through this uh, process, pass this rule. Another big thing that happened in 2019 for us was a new administration. The previous eight years had been under the administration of Rick Scott, who was a Florida governor. And now we have a new governor, Ron DeSantis, was inaugurated on January 8th in, in 2019. Well, in two days later, January 10th, he had this executive order 19-12, which implemented five big and even more sections of, of water issues and water quality issues. He announced his major water policy as his not just his campaign, he's in office, he wants to do something over the next four years. So number one was $2.5 billion over four years to do Everglades restoration and protect water resources. Number two was the Blue Green Algae Task Force. He wanted a task force to be of scientists set up to look into this blue green algae health issue problem. Number three was to advance this Everglades rest reservoir project south of the lake. So instead of dumping it east and west, we can send it south and store and treat and move that water south. And then four was getting this office of accountability and even a chief science officer for Florida, which was never heard of for many years. So he, the first thing, one of the first things he did was ask the Water Management District, which is a nine-member governing board, to, who are appointed by the governor, he asked them all to resign. So the old governing board that was in there kind of hemmed and hawed, but they eventually all resigned, and he appointed all nine new members of the governing board. These are all the nine new members of the governing board, which were, came into office at the middle of last year and really began to work. And this governing board is one of the most, most interactive and most open governing board for water policy I have ever seen in my 40-year history here. As you can see on the right uh, left, I just outlined that the South Florida Water Management District is all of South Florida from the Kissimmee, upper Kissimmee chain of lakes all the way down past to the Keys, whereas we have four other water management districts. So the governor appoints these members. They're not elected. And they manage thousands and millions of structures and millions of, of dollars worth of uh, infrastructure and work. The other thing the governor DeSantis did right away was ask the state legislature in the budget, which he drafts the budget, gives it to the legislature, for 625 million, which is that 2.5 billion divided by four years. Well, they actually allocated 682 million. So he actually got more than he asked for in the legislature, and 417 million of that was earmarked for the Everglades restoration projects. 107 million for the EA Reservoir Project, another 40 million for lifting Tamiami Trail. If you've never been down to 41 across Tamiami from Miami to uh, Trail to, from Miami to Naples, that's a long, narrow road built back in the 20s. 
and it formed a dam that dams up the water. So lifting that Tamiami Trail, allowing that water to flow is important. The C44, C43, other reservoirs and Blue Green Algae Project, water quality about another 225 million. So he is really successful at getting them to, go, let's get this really ball rolling here. So the EAA storage project is south of the lake. You can see these blue areas named A1 and A2. And the state re, uh, set aside these lands to be this Everglades Agricultural Reservoir. It's where we can put lake water into the reservoir, store it, and then treat it through stormwater treatment areas and let it move south. Much more than that little narrow amount, that couple hundred, uh, hundred billion gallons you saw in that earlier photo. So we want to move more water south. We want to put it under Tamiami Trail and allow it to flow through Shark River Slough and the Everglades National Park at the green area into Florida Bay to provide that uh, fresh water flow south. So this is the Blue Green Algae Task Force, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, five scientists from Gulf, different universities around our state. Very competent. They've met several times already. They've come up with a consensus document that recommends how to treat agriculture runoff, septic tanks, other kind of issues, and how to treat the pollution in the water so that we can stop these harmful algae blooms that are in Lake Okeechobee and the other waters. The other uh, department in Florida, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, deals with these, uh, their way to deal with the pollution and implement Clean Water Act is to talk about the total maximum daily load in these watersheds and how that affects the body. I'm not really fond of the idea of total maximum daily load. I think it should be a total minimum daily load of pollutants. But it's the pollution level at which that body of water would be totally impaired if it goes over that level of pollution. So they've come up with identifying that level of pollution and then getting a basin management action plan within each of these watersheds to do it. Well, the governor said, these aren't working, and you gotta update this, especially for these three watersheds, Lake Okeechobee, the Caloosahatchee, and the St. Lucie. And he said it's gotta be done by January 2020. So he put his Department of Environmental Protection on alert, says, you've gotta get this done by, next, by this year, right now, this month. And uh, they started last year, oh gosh, okay, fast track, and we'll see how that, that comes out. But it's encouraging, that started in 2019. The other thing that we do at Florida Oceanographic is we monitor weekly. And some of you in this room might be part of our water quality testing system weekly. We have 40 water testers, citizens water quality throughout the estuary. And once a week, you take water samples, we put them together in the map in the upper right, upper left, and then this was the grade, uh, basically the grade over that period of time from of 2019. And you can see it never got down below really a D or so, except for one or two times right there at the end of this year, but it really never got bad. Whereas times before, if I showed you similar graphs, they were way down and we got Fs and, and really bad grades because the water was so polluted. The graph at the bottom just shows some little blue spots right up in, in the end up there that uh, in the beginning in March where we did get some discharges from Lake Okeechobee, but that was the only blue that we saw. So we had good conditions in the lake from no conditions from the lake and good conditions in the estuary. What we also do at Florida Oceanographic is to reestablish habitat. We've lost a lot of oysters. We've lost a lot of seagrass in the estuary. We have efforts both to, for oyster restoration by recycling shell and shell material in our oyster hatchery at, at Florida Oceanographic. And we also have a foster program which takes fragments and replants those fragments in nursery environment at, at the center. And we replant those out into the environment. We've been very successful. And a lot of you, again, have volunteered to help us with these programs. Some of these uh, restoration sites you can see here, um, either using a combination of oyster and, and seagrass restoration as well as living shoreline. Those are the emergent grasses that you see along the shorelines of cordgrass and, and uh, marsh grass. So we're, we're all about restoration. So I want to close with just looking at this graph again, looking at these images again, what it used to be historically, unfortunately what the current flows are right now, and really what our desired flow is. This is what our desired flow. We want 
that restored Kissimmee. We want that water to slowly flow into Lake Okeechobee. We want it to go south to the Everglades to rehydrate that beautiful sawgrass marsh um, habitat that's really necessary and eventually get to Florida Bay and be that really beautiful estuary that it was in Florida Bay again and have the mixture of salt and fresh water and reestablish those seagrasses that were down there. So we're all about moving that water south, stopping those destructive discharges to the estuaries and let's get the water right here in Florida. So I, I wanna thank you for coming out tonight. We can talk and have some questions and I think we got time for that, but uh, we're all about saving our water. And I know we'll have some great questions. I'm just going to ask Mark to repeat the questions for our audience that's watching sure. uh, through our, our video sure. stream. Sure. But I got one. Yes, sir. It said, how successful are we at putting those oxbows back into the river? It's actually pretty successful. It takes a lot of work because you gotta, they, when they dredge that channel, they put the spoil up on the side. So they've got some of that to put back, but not, it doesn't all fill in. But they, where they have filled it in and, and they had reopened back the oxbows, it's very successful. It takes a lot. It takes some money. Uh, they're just about complete. And they started about set 10 years ago to try to really get it, that established. But they're almost complete by this 2021 right in here. So we're very encouraged by that. But it takes a lot of effort to put that back and then redo. But that oxbow is the natural form of a river. And as the river goes around that oxbow, the water is faster on the inside and slower on the outside. And what that does is helical flow the water so it turns it over from top to bottom as it goes around those bends and forms those sandbars that alligators lay up on and and the fish are fantastic i love going up there it's really beautiful yes sir in the back in the green ah. We've asked, we've heard about rising sea level, and it definitely is a factor, and it's definitely coming in. And those well fields, like in Hollywood and Fort Lauderdale, they've put their wells for the utility uh, drinking water west of the town, but they're having to move further west because they have saltwater intrusion. You might have heard of that. As the saltwater is rising, the head pressure from the sea is causing that to intrude into the freshwater well, so they're having to move those further west. The thing that the restoring the flow to the south will do is to rehydrate the Biscayne Aquifer. If you looked at those charts right down the middle of that Everglades, from the Everglades Ag Area right down through the middle of the park, is the top of the Biscayne Aquifer. And then it flows down and gets about two to 300 feet below the surface in Miami-Dade and Lauderdale. So the top of the Biscayne where it's recharged is the Everglades. And if we can recharge that aquifer, we can hold back some of that saltwater intrusion. But more importantly, the vegetation at the south end of Florida it will change. It will change from a sawgrass to more of a mangrove habitat. Because as sea level rise and more estuary, you know, the estuary becomes more oceanic and in and, and salinity, it will drive away the freshwater saw, sawgrass and it erodes away the peat layers of which that sawgrass is, is built on. And so we've already started to see that in some respects. So there again is another reason to restore that flow to the Everglades and allow that fresh water to hold back some of the sea level. It's not gonna stop sea level rise or the flooding. And believe me, a lot of communities at the southeast part of our state are in climate crisis, They're, they've gone beyond this climate change idea. They're in climate crisis because they get king tides don't only, aren't the only tides that flood those streets. We get a lot more that flood because of the sea level rise happening. And they're having to figure out how are these drain structures going to work if we continue to have sea level rise. Very good question. Up here in the front, we'll go right on back here. Yes. Uh -huh. 
In, in our estuary, it's estimated about 10, about 10 to 12 percent of the nitrogen that comes into our system, into our estuary, is caused from septic tank. The other almost 90 percent or so comes from all the other runoff that comes in, not septic tank. Are septic tanks an issue? Absolutely. And they, if they're too close to the water or to the watershed, and if they're too dense, too many of them in one area, the drain fields will be too close to the water and allow that, that nutrients to load up the system. But if they're out in a rural environment, non-density, low density, they're in well-drained soils away from a watershed, then septic tanks work fine. Septic tanks don't work in the Keys. On coral rock, they don't work. Um, and we know that. And there are places in our watershed where Martin County, for instance, identified where they're not working or where they're too high density. And they've gone to central you know, collective systems or central hookups. And that's important if we want to identify that as a, as a pollution source and start to do that. Very good question. There was one, right? Well, it's, it's still the Indian River is still has its issues as well. We're down at the southern end of the Indian River Lagoon. If you go, our, the Indian River Lagoon is 150 miles long, all the way from Ponce Inlet north of Cape Canaveral to Jupiter Inlet. So we're at the southern end, and the southern influence is mostly from the Lake Okeechobee and other local runoff. But that seagrass community right there is impacted primarily there. If you go up the Indian River, it's not, there's only five inlets that connect the Indian River Lagoon to the ocean. And that's why it's a lagoon. It's not a real river. It doesn't have a freshwater source. However, there are major canals that come, that have been built for drainage into the Indian River Lagoon. And there are a lot of them up north. And again, septic tanks are very high density way up in, let's say, Merritt Island or other places in the Indian River. Again, not knowing what that would do, but it's causing a lot of pollution locally there that can't be flushed out through an inlet. So what you get is these very highly polluted areas in the Indian River because it's very stagnant. And then you get these algae blooms up there of a different type of algae, not microcystis, but it's still harmful to fish and wildlife. In fact, there are huge fish kills. Zach, when was that fish kill? Just two years ago or? In the upper banana, yeah, about. The last big banana River was caused by a, another type of algae bloom, as Mark mentioned, that's not toxic, but it takes oxygen out of the water and the fish suffocates. Sucks 70 right miles up. of dead fish. Yeah, it was terrible. Yes, in the back. Yeah. That's the honor system. So the question is, is BMAP the honor system? So we got to distinguish between the Basin Management Action Plan, the BMAP, and, and BMPs. BMPs are the best management practices. And what you're suggesting and saying is correct, that the, the agricultural community put into place to control those, those runoff BMPs, the best management practices. And there are a series of these water practices that a farmer can do or somebody can do, and they are voluntary in a way. They're not regulated, and they're not stopping the pollution. So this water management board has recognized that the BMPs are not following that uh, course of action and not stopping the pollution. Yep. That's it. Yep. So the question is, why don't we monitor those runoff to make sure they're not lying? And the one graph I showed you with all the loadings coming from are the monitors that we have, and we are monitoring. Nobody's enforcing that pollution standard that needs to happen. So you're absolutely right in identifying the fact that BMPs are those voluntary things that we as a, a big agricultural community say, yes, we'll follow these steps and we'll reduce our runoff. But nobody is monitoring how well they're doing and it's left up to that person, that landowner, to actually turn in their reports and say, yeah, we're, we're, we're abiding by that. 
But now we need to get these state agencies out there to do exactly what you said. And if we find a, a one location out there that's more polluting than another, I'd rather a taxpayer work with that farmer at the source of the problem, at the source of where that pollution is coming from, whether it's their farm or what, and help them to build a stormwater treatment area or some sort of treatment on that site rather than wait till it all gets downstream and, a big, and have to build a big project somewhere. So I'm all about working with it at the source. Yes, ma'am, right next. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. The question is about how do we stop uh, somebody from tapping a water source like up in our springs in North Florida. Yep. We have spring rich water that comes down from actually the, the Florida aquifer that fills from the southern part of our country in Georgia, Carolinas, all kind of comes down and really causes a lot of pressure and in static to our springs. Beautiful spring environments in North Florida. But, as you mentioned, they're being tapped out for water supply. And in this case, she's mentioning for bottle water, to bottle, you know, uh, bottle water, which is always twice as bad because it creates a plastic bottle somewhere that causes plastic pollution. So you're absolutely right to point that out. We ought to identify that practice at that location. And our springs have been not only tapped out, but they've also been polluted. There's a whole part of that bill that Governor DeSantis put up to $50 million about spring watersheds. Because around every spring, there's all this land use that could be creating pollution to that spring. And you don't notice it until it comes up in the spring. And those springs have turned into these really filamentous algae systems where I, as a kid, used to dive in Silver Springs and Silver River, and it was crystal clear. You didn't even know you were in water. It was so clear. And it was just beautiful. But you go back there now, and it's turbid and dirty, and, the, and there's no eelgrass anymore. It's all this filamentous algae. It's, it's polluted. It's terrible. It's unfortunate. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Back now. Uh huh. Good. Um, it, the question is about the C44 uh, reservoir project. As part of that comprehensive Everglades restoration plan, two of those components were right here, and we would call Indian River and Indian River South. And the one of them is the C44. Along that canal called C44 Canal, there's a project to build a reservoir and pump the water out of the canal into the reservoir and allow it to go through stormwater treatment areas and back into the, into the canal. So that treatment project is the contract's almost complete. Uh, they've almost completed the reservoir in about another two years. Um, and the stormwater treatment areas, the marshes, have already been completed. And the governor last uh, two months ago turned on one of those uh, marshes to get it started to hydrate and rebuild the grasses that'll treat the water as it goes out. But again, that C44 project is only going to treat that basin. It's not going to take the harmful discharges from Lake Okeechobee. It's only treating that uh, C44 basin, about 116,000 acres of primarily citrus in that, in that area. Let's go over here. Yes, ma'am. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 The question is about the Corps of Engineers schedule. So before they get that Lake Okeechobee system operating manual, the new schedule into effect on October 2022, we're still under the Lowers 2008, the Lake Okeechobee schedule of 2008. I know it seems antiquated now, but that's what the schedule we're under. So operating that last year, as you saw that chart, we were in pretty good shape, right? We followed the bottom line and went up. And we had no releases to the estuary except early, early on. 
Well, the Corps might decide this year that they want to hold more water in the lake for water supply. So during this time of dry season, which is November through May, during the winter months, November through May is our dry season, and usually May through October is our wet season. So November through May, they need water supply for primarily south of Lake Okeechobee. So they don't want that lake to go too low because they draw water from that in order for it to hydrate, to irrigate sugarcane primarily. And so, in fact, in year 2000, year 2000, we were actually tr drowning the lake so much it was hurting the lake ecology. So the management district said, well, we got to share the adversity and lower that lake and try to uh, lower it down to get going. Well, it kept going down in the dry season and it got to, in 2021, it got, or 2001, 2001, got to its lowest level it ever had gotten at 8.67 feet in elevation. And so they bought 14 forward pumps and put them into the lake. So if it drops down to even seven feet in, in elevation, they can still pump water out. So don't let anybody scare you to say, oh, they could never get irrigation water and they're going to have a water shortage and all of that. No, you aren't going to have a water shortage. In fact, they took a lot of municipal, there's only the Okeechobee, the town of Okeechobee at the top end of the lake is one of the only ones still left in getting their water supply from the lake. But it's, uh, and it's deep in the, in the water there, so they don't have a problem. So water supply is mainly, when you hear that, it's for irrigation and agricultural use, and primarily the sugar industry that, that really demands that. So they're getting pressure onto the core to keep the lake higher. We're putting pressure to keep the lake down and low, and we want what's healthy for the lake, and we don't want any discharges to come to these estuaries, ideally. Great question. Anybody else? Great. Gosh, I must have done an okay job then. Hey. Yes, sir. Oh, interesting point. Why don't we dredge the lake so that we can hold more water? The lake does have a lot of silt and sediment in it, so imagine a big kind of bowl and you've got a, a bottom in it, you know, and you, you can dredge that out. You can put more water in it for a while, but then you're going to get to that elevation that's still that elevation. And what they talk about is the dike around the lake. The real concern is that dike. That dike was built in 1930s and they dug muck out of the lake and piled it up. And they built this dike around the lake thinking, well, that'll hold it. But when it got high in 1998, there were 90 locations around the dike that were level one to level four of a breach, meaning level one is wet soil, level four is actually siphoning right through the soil and breaching the dike. And since then, every time it gets near 15 feet in elevation, the Corps of Engineers just goes ballistic, says we can't do it. So they have a Herbert Hoover Dike Rehabilitation Project it's about a $1.8 billion pr project, and it'll be completed in 2022. And they're putting a head wall right down the middle of the dike, the earthen dike. They're putting a head wall, a big wide concrete wall, all the way down 35 feet to bedrock of this concrete wall. And they've done from Port Mayaka to down to Pahokee and Belle Glade. They're going around the south end of the lake and then up to, the, up to Clewiston. So they're trying to do that south rim with this head wall in order to prevent any kind of flooding. But it's a, it's a dangerous situation. And when that lake got up to 18-something feet in elevation, there was a lot of concern. Everybody in Pahokee and Belle Glade and the Glades community south of the lake were evacuating. I mean, if I lived down there too, I would be getting out of the way. Because if that, if that lake breached with that high level, it would flow down. And I saw, I think it was Charlie or Irma that came, Wilma, that came around from the north and the winds came from the north. The lake level was went from about, it was about 16 and a half feet. It went to 21 feet in elevation on the south end and it went down to about uh, 10, 10 and a half feet on the north end because of the wind that pushed across that 730 square mile open water, pushed all that water, that surge, up to the south point. And I went to Pahokee afterwards, and you could see a big scarp coming right out of the inside of that dike. 
And if it would have been a little more duration of time, it probably would have breached right through that dike at the Pohokee Airport. Flooded everybody out. It was a tremendous. We'll take maybe two more. Yes, ma'am. Here. Ooh. <laughs> I th and that's a good question. And I think everybody heard that. So. <laughs> but what kind of question, what kind of political influence does the sugar industry have? Well, let me tell you, real briefly. Um, the sugar cane lobbyists, since 1930, when they were formed, the U.S. Sugar Corporation, have had huge amounts of lobbyists, both in the federal and the state governments. And in year 2000, I went up to testify before Senator Luger, at the, he was the head in Indiana Senator, he was the, in the, uh, the chairman of the Committee of Forestry and Agriculture. And he asked myself and Shannon Estenos from the World Wildlife Fund to come up and testify how this pollution was causing from the sugar industry causing it. Because he was interested in getting the sugar subsidy out of the farm bill. Every five years, the farm bill comes up. And the farm bill has a lot in it. It helps farmers subsidize their crops if they needed to. But the sugar subsidies, which aren't true subsidies, they're price supports and import quotas. And by that, I mean the price support is like at 18 to 22 cents a pound. And if it drops below 18 cents a pound for domestic sugar, they forfeit their federal loans and you and I back that surplus sugar and we have to sell it on the world market at eight or nine cents a pound and it, and the AFTA, CAFTA, NAFTA, all these trade agreements they're all up to say they have to have restrictions on them in through the farm bill in order to restrict imports of sugar because they say they can't compete so you and I pay for domestic sugar prices quite a bit more and they're they're protecting that that industry by having lobbyists so myself and another environmental person were up there at testimony. There were eight and maybe 10 lobbyists up there from the sugar industry. And they were all in nice three-piece suits. And they were happy to see. And I, I was only there for that one time. They're there every day, all the time, in every office, lobbying for their industry. And they're well paid. And the problem with the farm bill is, is it's the, the sugar industry is tied to sugar beets as well as sugar cane. And sugar beets, if you're from the Midwest, sugar beet farmers are small farmers that have sugar beets that are used for sugar in our domestic sugar, and they're part of that. So I told Senator Luger at the time, if you could take away sugar beets away from the sugar cane, the cane is really a big industry. It's really a corporate big industry. I mean, they've mechanized the harvest now. Uh, they don't have the thousands of Jamaicans who used to come up and cut cane and they're still burning their cane to burn it off before they harvest it to get rid of all the the, the waste stuff in, in below the cane before they harvest just out of convenience it's cheaper to do that and that burning is a big Sierra Club's campaign to stop the burning they've gotten Glades community people who have asthma and kids are growing up with smoke coming into their classroom so thick they can't see the back of the classroom it's really dangerous out there, and uh, they still are burning those fields, and we're really campaigning not to do that. But yes, how much influence they have? A lot. And until we get our political subsidy out of there, and until we get our political people like the governor or others who say, I'm not going to take sugar campaign money, then that's what you got to do. You got to have them right up front say, the industry is not going to influence me and these decisions. We need what's healthy for the people and what's, in, what's good for folks. Um, one more in the back. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. So the, so the question is, is what's the political view of this uh, water rights that uh, people have the right to pump out that water and use it for that purpose, whether it's to bottle up the water or use it. Florida has, has, doesn't have the water rights issues that they do in California, Arizona, or other places. They have true water rights, which are like mineral rights. These waters of our state and below the, the surface belong to the public. And basically, yes, they should have an allocation, 
and that allocation for water supply to pump that water out and use it either in a municipal water or pumping it for bottling it or whatever, they have to have a permit to do that. They have to have a water allocation permit. And that consumptive use permit, a CUP, consumptive use permit, comes from that water management district. And guess what? In January 31st, on Friday, they're meeting in Port St. Lucie at the government office, and their workshop on that next day is about consumptive use permits. So we all who are interested in that ought to show up there, learn about what it is, and ask them that same question. How can you grant a consumptive use permit to somebody who's literally stealing water? Yes, sir. One. Oh, okay. Oh, to, the, the, position of the, the position of our political leadership is hard to read sometimes because, uh, okay, uh, I only know that the governor has expressed his interest in maintaining Florida's water rights to the public and maintaining the fact that allocations through his agencies should be allocated only for those proper uses and, and allocated for the purposes for that and not over allocated. I don't know how far he'll go or even the other folks will go. The congressional leadership has not much of an interest. Congressional leadership, we have 27 congressmen and two senators. Our congressional delegation federally doesn't really look into. They leave that water rights up to the state. So we really need to look to the governor, and you need to look at the 120 representatives we have in the state legislature and the 40 state senators we have and ask each one of them that question. What are you doing about that water rights that really all that water should belong to us as the public and you're over allocating it for this industry to make a profit. I totally agree with you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. All right. I'll be around. <laughs>